Um, I, shall I start? Great. Hi, my name is Michael. Welcome again to the Junodev Singapore uh, the, the Coders Coding Dojo. Uh, how many of you are here for the first time uh, with a Junodev uh, event? Or, yeah, okay, cool. Great. Welcome, you all. Um, so, the Coding Dojo is uh, or the developer's gym is something that we do, uh, we want to do like every two weeks. We will try something different every two weeks. So this week we're doing a coding dojo where we'll be doing some coding challenges. So what is a coding dojo, right? So uh, let's go quickly to this. A coding dojo, coding dojo is a meeting where a bunch of coders like you get together and work on code and programming challenges. So that's, this is where you hope you hopefully can have fun uh, and you engage in some deliberate practice. So deliberate practice is in coding something deliberately and, and, and trying to improve your skill along the way, right? So this is a uh, something that's good for you, I hope. <laughs> um, so the, the goals for today, uh, for the coding dojo, is for first of all for you to improve your knowledge in the language or framework, uh, and also for some of you who might also be interested in picking up a new language. So this is also an opportunity for you to learn the new language from someone in in the crowd. And of course, for the for the more seasoned developers, this could also be an opportunity for you to, to, to kind of develop some uh, uh, good developer developer practices like TDD, BDD, and uh, even to do some pair programming along the way, right? So I hope you are in, through this coding dojo, you can try and learn some of these things. Um, can, can you see from from that corner? Okay, right. Okay. So uh, as part of the coding dojo, we'll be attempting code katas. Code katas are basically programming challenges, which will basically uh, be a problem you need to solve. Right? So kata in, in karate is an exercise where you repeat the same form many, many times. So in a sense, uh, the thing about coding challenges like this and coding code katas like this is that you may, try, you may attempt it in one way the first time you looked at it. In subsequent times, you will try again, you actually have a different approach because you have, a, you have a different knowledge or different uh, perspective on how to write code, right? So in some coding, some coding uh, dojos, they even go extreme to the point of you try attempting the code the first time, you delete it and try, try again uh, a second time and you have a different perspective. So today we won't, go, we won't be that extreme. <laughs> we'll be just trying it uh, one time in one language and we'll try our best to, to, to refactor it because there are other things I want, want you to uh, experience as well, right? So which is uh, learning about test-driven development and pair programming. So in code kata, you need to try it many, many times and you, be, you have to be comfortable with making mistakes. Don't be worried about, oh, I don't know how, what, how, how to do this or I don't know how, to, I don't, I, am, I, am I doing it right? Don't worry about it, just try. It's okay to make mistakes and it's okay to Google. It's okay to stack overflow the answer because they are, we are, we are, our memory banks are quite limited, right? So it's okay to Google for things and find things online if you are not sure. So always look for feedback. So as you write something, cause that's why we're doing this as a pair. So as you pair program on something and then your, your, your pair can also, your partner can also give you some feedback and you all can learn from each other, right? So the point of kata is not to arrive at the correct answer. Although arriving at the correct answer is nice, <laughs> but the point is the stuff you learn along the way, okay? So the goal of the practice is, the goal is the practice, to practice coding, right? Not the solution. Of course, if you get a solution, yes, big yay, but you know, um, it's not the point, okay? And yes, wax on, wax off. <laughs> not many people know this reference. Okay, so, uh, so the, for the code, code kata, we'll be doing this in the test-driven way. So let's give you a quick overview of what test-driven development is. How many of you actually know what test-driven development is? Yeah, quite a few. Okay, the rest of, for the rest of you, is basically writing tests first before you write code, right? So what you, what you want to do is before you write the production code, you think about how you want to use the production code first. And that's how you, uh, then, in, that, in that way, uh, the way they exercise the production code is to write tests. I'm going to test this code, this particular function on this, on this particular class. It should give me this certain response, right? So this is what, there's the test, test code. So once you read the test code, it, because the production code is not written yet, your test will always fail, so which is why it's red. So once you, and then the next step is to write production code, a little bit of the production code, just to make the test pass, right? So basically just write enough code to make the test, your test that you have written pass, and then to turn it green, right? So you don't have to worry about uh, making, it, making it awesome or like very, very performant or whatever, just make it pass first. So the next, then the last step is the refactor step, which is to go back and look at the code, what have I written, 
and can ask your your uh, coding partner or pair to kind of look look review at your code and how why, how can we improve this? There are many things you can improve your code on. Number one could be performance, right? You might be doing a lot of things in a brute force way, so you might want to find a more performant way to do do things. You might also want to refactor your code for readability, as in you you want someone to look at your code and say, ah, okay, I know what what this guy is trying to do, right? Right, there's, a, there's a lot of principles you can follow for refactoring. So today we'll just be, uh, so look to your pair later to ho hopefully you can find someone who is more experienced, as, uh, more experienced than you and then they, you can also learn from them, right? Okay, so the, the, the whole cycle is uh, rate green refactor, TDD. That's a TDD cycle that we go through. So later on, we'll be, uh, uh, I'll be sharing with you a re repository which will give you uh, guidelines on, guides on how to set up your own test suite, your own test environment then can you write the test yourself, right? So some of the rules of test-driven uh, test development. First of all, start with a test. Only write enough, uh, only start writing production code after your automated tests are working, right? Or, and then it's failing because you know, your, your code is not written yet. So always start with a test. So there, as a programmer, we like to always think about solution first, but this is kind of, so we have to kind of pull ourselves back and say, okay, before I think about how to, how to write, how to implement the code, I think about how I'm going to, I want to use the code first. Right? Think about how you're going to you call the function, what arguments you need to pass in. So these are things you should think about before you even start thinking about writing the code. So that, why do we do this? Because if we, took, if we take this approach in designing our code first before we actually implement it, uh, things we think it, then you can think then you can optimize the code for readability. So someone who look at your function and say, oh, okay, this function does this one particular thing, right? So it's help, very helpful in this. So write test first. Uh, next thing about our baby steps, always only have one filling test at, at a time. So there will always a temptation to write a lot of tests, and write a lot of code, and but then everything starts filling and you start panicking, right? So don't do that. Write only one filling test, pass the filling test, then go back and write the next filling test, right? So don't rush into it. T pass, uh, use baby steps. And we also write small tests. Small tests are basically like four or five liners, right? Don't make it too complicated. Oh, I need to set up this, this database here. I want to set up this thing there. Don't need to go that far, right? Just make it pass first. I mean, if it, it may, to certain, certain, in some uh, programming languages, you may even have to go as far as mocking code, mocking uh, how the libraries you need to collaborate with and even stubbing out uh, responses from API calls or whatnot, right? So this is about writing, uh, how you should go about writing tests. Make it small. And then so it's readable, easy to understand. And when it fails, you know where you can kind of like, there's only four or five lines you can look at and see, and see what's going on. <clears throat> and also next step, uh, once you've written the test, you write the production code. But when writing production code, we have always a temptation to write to kind of like, wow, let's just write 450 lines or whatever. No, go just write enough code to make it, make it pass first. Because your test will, will basically poke at your code. And basically you want your code to be easy to understand. Uh, and just write just enough to pass whatever uh, the test is, 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 is checking, right? To some extent, you may even cheat. Like, <laughs> like I could write uh, a test that, could, uh, that will assert that your, your function returns a particular string. So the first attempt of this would be to write a, a, a hard code, a string response. This could be as simple as that. And the next step would be to write another code that will actually say, make sure that you're actually returning something dynamic instead of hard coded stuff, right? So this is how you slowly grow your code, your test, your test suite and code coverage, and test coverage. And also that's how you evolve your code, right? So basically, write enough production code, no extra code. Next step, uh, implement the simplest algorithm first. So as I said earlier, don't, don't try and think, think too deeply into this problem. Just solve it first with the simplest, most straightforward algorithm. It may even be a brute force. You may want to brute force it and, f and solve it first. So they get a pa test passing. Then the next step is to refactor. The refactor step is where I come in and look at the code again. Well, how have I designed this? How could I design it better? Are there, are there things in the language syntax, that, uh, in, the, in the language that could help you uh, do this in less uh, lines of code, right? So stuff that you can think about later on. Of course, don't forget to refactor. So refactor your code. Uh, so because, you know, well, refactor your code for readability, refactor your code for, uh, to reduce duplication and stuff like that, right? Your test code are also code that you need to maintain. So do refactor your test as well, right? So the test code uh, is a different, it's usually a separate file. So make sure your, your, test, your test file is also, also readable and easy to understand. Don't worry, these slides are actually uh, in, uh, there's a link to these slides in the repo that I asked you to check out earlier. So you can check that out later. Right, so refactor your test. 
<coughs> don't refactor your test when you're, uh, don't refactor when your tests are failing. So make make a test pass first before you start refactoring things. Because when you see so many things um, breaking and your tests are failing and you start refactoring, you'll be you're like hitting a moving target. So that's not very nice, right? So remember to make sure your tests are passing first before you start refactor. So that's all I have about TDD. So next I'll talk about pair programming. So pair programming, you know, it's an agile software technique, uh, development technique where two programmers work together and one workstation. So basically, in, remember in the meetup page, I'll ask you all to bring along a keyboard and mouse if you can, so that you can hopefully share or write code on, on one, of your, one of your friend's computers, right? So essentially, in a pair, there are usually two roles. One is the driver, the person who has control of the keyboard, and he's the one who types and writes the code. And there'll be an observer or navigator. So it's somebody who reviews your code as, as you type it, or even give you advice on how to, what to, on different approaches to solving the problem. Of course, the role can interchange at any, any, any time, right? So you can, you can switch roles frequently. So as you, if you have an idea, let me, you can ask for the keyboard. Can I have a keyboard, please? Then you can type, it, type through your answer. Otherwise, you can let the other person do it. So in today's case, I don't think uh, many of you brought your own keyboards. It's okay. So we have, you can use, you can just shift the computer left and right, and then uh, you know let, let the person type along with you. Of course, you brought a keyboard, uh, and that would be awesome as well. If you need a mechanical keyboard, I have one in my bag. I can lend you later. <laughs> okay. So pair of is like this: uh, sit, sit together, you type, uh, type. Uh, uh, usually, one computer with two sets of keyboard and two sets of mouse. And, what the, and I'll also share with you some practical tips now when you say do pair programming, how you could optimize your, your user experience. So first of all, be conversational. Uh, talk through your thought process because people can't read minds because you know, we, we are humans and we, we don't communicate telepathically. So you should, you should think, because there are so many times when you're writing code, you're like so deep in thought, you're like, oh, I got, I got, I got, a, I got a solution in my brain right now. Yes, it's the most awesome code. But then again, no one, only you, no one else but only you know. La. So yeah, so be, be conversational. Talk through your thought process because that also, help, that also helps. Because uh, as you talk through your thought process, you also clarify your, your thinking and your partner or coding partner can also help you to kind of fact check or even you can bounce ideas off each other on how to solve a problem, right? So be conversational, talk through your thought process because people can't read minds. Uh, plan, so take time to plan through what you hope to achieve at the beginning of the pairing session. So basically, take out, uh, think about what, how you want to approach this, come up with a to-do list, even think about uh, different approaches you want, want to, want to, want to, uh, want to uh, approach this. And uh, that goes to the next point, which is about taking notes. As you plan, maybe take, take some notes. Sometimes it's, it's just faster to communicate an idea through paper. Later, I'll pass you a worksheet so you can, there's also some space you can also draw stuff in the, at the bottom. So as you think about how you want to solve a problem, you can also draw on it as well, right? If you need more paper, you can, we can also get more paper for you. So having a paper to can draw on, actually you can use that to communicate like architectural design and even come up with bullet points uh, on paper, right? In the past, when I was working as a consultant uh, at Neo, we, our, our pairing session is actually right next to a whiteboard. So you just get up and start drawing on the whiteboard randomly, right? So uh, it's very helpful for, for us to kind of like brainstorm ideas and even come up with a very simple to-do list. So let's, let's check. Every time we, we finish something, we'll check off stuff on the whiteboard. Very helpful, very, very useful, right? So think, so always be, don't, don't, don't worry about killing the environment or killing trees because they're already dead. <laughs> but we can recycle, right? Um, also agree on a pair, pairing workflow. So there are many pairing uh, uh, workflow they can use. Uh, one of the uh, workflow we, uh, they think of is called the ping pong method, which is one person will write the test and the other person will write the code, right? So this is actually one workflow you can, you can think about. All right? Or you can want just one person exclusively just typing the other one, just giving instructions. That also can work, right? Uh, so you, you think you can agree on a workflow and you can always change it up as you go along. Doesn't, don't, don't worry about it. Always focus on the work at hand. Don't get distracted by non non work uh, PM. So like you got like, you know, a push notification coming in or or uh, Facebook uh, Facebook messages or whatever. Try to try to cherish each other's time, and you're doing this together. You only have three hours to do this. Actually, two plus hours. So yeah. Um, so focus on the work at hand. Also share keyboard time. So your keyboard is you know don't don't hog the keyboard, right? In this case, don't hog the don't hog the laptop. So do share it and let others let your pair also speak through the code. Right, so don't worry about. Uh, so be patient because some, because some people are not familiar with uh, your, the keyboard 
uh, layout, it may be a bit slow in typing out the, the words or whatever, but you must be patient with each other because you want to learn uh, from each other as well. Okay? So here are some of the practical tips for pair programming. Last thing, uh, use screen cues. Um, I, because you're using one screen, so it's fine, but in some cases where you actually have like two screens, uh, people pair, pair program on two screens, and one, one guy will point at his screen, oh, this particular lab code, and the other guy was like, where, where? Right? So because you're pointing at your screen, the other person is looking at his own screen only, right? So you can't, then you can lean over and you encroach on your personal space, you know, not too good. Uh, but yeah, so uh, use screen cues, use your, use your mouse and cursor to kind of like shake, shake and look at things, kind of thing. If you're using a Mac, if you shake at something, you will shake your cursor a little bit, uh, your, your cursor gets grows a little bit bigger, so that's also helpful in, in, in drawing attention to things. So always use uh, screen cues if you can. Sometimes you may want to say, oh, line 15, uh, this is the problem, I think is, is a pro this slide has a problem. So just say it out and even highlight the line if you can right, so that the person can, 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 no can notice uh, where your where focus is. Right? So that's helpful. So use a mouse cursor instead of your finger. The last thing also I want to share with you is uh, take breaks. And you, as you're doing pair programming, it's a very intense experience. You're like your entire brain and mind and, and, and body is kind of involved with writing code, right? And it's very intensive. I, I remember the first few weeks I was doing pair programming, my whole body was so exhausted at the end of the day that, you know, I go home, I cannot write any more code. I'm, 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 at home, I'm just blank, watch, and I stone there, watch TV. <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, but so, so one way to, to reduce the, the strain on, your, on, 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 you, on you is to take frequent breaks. So sometimes one, one approach would be like uh, once you finish a certain number of uh, tests and number of code uh, and you reach a certain natural break point in your code, take a break, right? So usually that is in an hour, hour, half kind of a, kind of a, 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 a time frame. Usually one, once you hit a one hour mark or one hour, one hour, one and a half hour mark, you probably your you know, your 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 saturation point. So that's where you usually should take a break. Take a break. Take a fifteen minute break. A bio break. Get a drink. You know, relax a little bit. Play some ping pong. Although ping pong paper is not available, but it's okay. Yeah, so you play some ping pong or do something else, and then you come back to the code. Because as a relaxed mind, is is actually you can think you can think clearly. You can think more. You can think more clearly. You can also articulate better. And it, and it can you you know have you ever heard of this thing called about shower thoughts, right? You know you like you have this brilliant idea where you're not thinking about the problem, right? So something similar, right? Sometimes when you relax and then oh wait ah now I know how to solve the problem. Let's go and you go back and you have this renewed energy to do it, right? So taking breaks is important because you know it's it's relaxing. <laughs> all right. So after all that rubbish, I hope what was it. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it was. I hope everything I shared with you was helpful, and, uh, and you, you can learn and you can find a link to the what I've, what I've shared in in the repo that I, that uh, that I talked to. I showed you earlier on. So today's code kata, we'll be doing a little, very simple challenge. So today's code kata is basically a minesweeper kata. Uh, have you all heard of minesweeper? Right, so the Minesweeper game in Windows, we, I, I hope you all have played it before. You have not, it's okay, I'll, go, I'll go do a quick introduction of what it is. So Minesweeper is a, a game in Windows, so the starting point is where your board looks like this. <coughs> and underneath, underneath this board, every, under every single tile, there could be either a bomb, uh, a mine, or there's nothing. Right, so if you tap on, uh, uh, if you tap on the tile to expose it, and there's no mine underneath it, you will, you will open up and show you the different tiles that are, that are around it that are also safe. At the same time, it will show you a number there, right? So the number three, for example, will, will means that uh, uh, inside this tile number three, there's probably around it in its, in its proximity, there's probably three bombs or three mines in its proximity. So in this number two, for example, in its, pro in its proximity of eight tiles around it, there's probably two, bo two bombs, uh, two mines around it somehow, right? Somewhere in there, there's two mines. It could be covered or not, and or uncovered at the point, right? Of course, you would tap on a mine when you're playing the game. The whole, the whole game blows up, and you, you see something like this, and you die. <coughs> okay, so your so and then when you actually finish the game, you unveil itself, and you see all the different tiles that you have marked as mines, and you find uh, the ones that are, uh, you still find a bunch of numbers that tells you that where the mines could be. So our uh, yeah. Can I just check something? Can I go through slide? Sure. For the for the figure on top, right, there are six. The, for the, yeah, there are six blank spaces. Mm -hmm. That means when you click on cursor, uh, any of the six, it will become an end. 
Yeah, I click. I, I think this guy probably tap, maybe tap on this one, and it opens up the rest and tells you, okay, these these six tiles are safe, and around this, uh, in this proximity around here, there are like one bomb around, one bomb around, and kind of thing. So. But if you click on any of the six, it will still become a six, right? Yeah, correct. So you, and you click on any of the six, you see open up this this six. But your 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 goal is not to implement the game. You don't need to implement a game. So, <laughs> so, so you don't need to implement a game. What you need to implement is to, impl is to, is to, is to generate this bot. Right. So essentially, what we'll, what we'll be doing is you'll be writing a software that takes in two arguments. Number one, it will be the grid size. How big is the bot? Because in a, in a Mind Super game, you can actually extend and, and make the bot bigger and smaller. So you get this, the number of columns and, and rows. Uh, and then you also, you, you also get a list of mind coordinates like where the mind could potentially be. So in this, in the, so, so you'll be a, a, a ASCII text like this with star and dots. The star represents where the mind is and the dot means it's a safe or empty, empty uh, uh, towel. So this is an example. So uh, given, uh, given the grid, uh, grid size of four by four, so it's a four by four grid, and I take in a sequence of minds like this, Right, so by four by four, and then there's two stars here. I should your function should return this, right? Where the star is basically the mine, and then the number is basically telling me how many mines are around this. And when there's uh, it's a safe, uh, when there's no mines around this dot, you should just be a dot. Well, around this tower, it should be a dot, right? So the star is the mine. Uh, a cell with no proximity to mines should show a dot. A cell in proximity to mine should be represented by the number of mines that is in this proximity, right? And there are also exceptions. There are two exceptions. Number one is that if you give it a zero zero, you should return an empty response. Okay, as in the grid size. <coughs> if you give it a empty mine list, like you don't you don't you don't set the, the number of mines that are inside there, it will just return you a grid of dots. So if it's a four by four grid, we don't set the mines. You just use four dots, uh, four by four rows of dots, right? Okay. So this is a guideline. Uh, how you implement it in code is up to you, right? Um, here are some test 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 cases you can use. <laughs> so if you give a three by two, like so, you, uh, and this mine coordinates, you should then come up with something like this: five by three. You should, and you tell you where the mines are. And this is what all you should generate. And the twelve by six, you see only one. Uh, twelve by six is only one one bomb. This should be what it generates. Okay. Right. And so, are we clear about about the kata so far? There's a worksheet here with more details. You can look at the worksheet later, and there will be help. There will basically be the exact details that I just share with you on on screen. But so right now, you should pair with somebody who is, who wants to do this in the same language as you. Use TDD to come up with the solution because you know TDD is fun. <laughs> or if you're not, you've not, you've not done TDD before, you should pair with somebody who actually does, who do know TDD, so they can also learn about the testing techniques and all that stuff. We also have a couple of like mentors around, beyond Max. We also have Tongwei at the back there, <laughs> bit shy, and Paul. Paul, Paul is also helpful, and of course we have Daryl at the back. So Daryl is our host uh, at Talkworks. Thank you, Daryl, for hosting us. Yeah. So uh, Daryl can also be uh, uh, ment uh, be mentoring or even share uh, or pairing one of you later. Okay. Um, and of course, we have Ted. Hello, Ted. Hello. You're helping, right? Okay. Yeah. So if you want uh, to, you have any questions about test room development or anything uh, about the code kata later, you can ask any of us. Uh, if you need us to pair with you or if there's an odd number, we can also pair with you as well. Right. Just a show of hands, who wants to do it in JavaScript? Yeah, a couple of you. Anything, anything other than JavaScript? <laughs> Someone in C sharp. C sharp. I think Paul can I can pair with him. <laughs> can, but then you need to find someone who knows C plus plus. Do you know? Try something you can do. Write tests in la. <laughs> yeah, you you can you write tests in C plus plus can right? Okay, there's a way. You want to figure it out with him or? <laughs> <laughs> or you want to try something? Uh, well, up to you. I mean, if you, 
It, it's a, it's yeah. best you try a language where there we can we have others that can pair you can pair program with you lah. JavaScript also. We didn't force you into this hall. <laughs> <laughs> right. So uh, here are two repos you can look at. Uh, number one is uh, the the repo that I talked about. So let me show you the repo. Uh, in this repository, uh, so it's github.com slash uh, Singapore uh, slash coding underscore dojo. So this is, uh, we have uh, compiled a list of all the um, starting points you can use. So in this over here, you have uh, a photo of our first dev gym and the link to the slides, which I, which I just showed you. Uh, the deck of slides with all, the, with all the little helpful hints and all that, you can look at that later. And of course, there's some bootstrap guides, uh, how to get started with uh, writing tests in C-sharp, F-sharp, Golang, Java, Kotlin, Node.js, Python, Ruby, Rust, and Swift. So you need to write tests in any of this. So I'll just top pop into one of them. Like for example, Node.js, I know a lot of you will be using Node later, uh, JavaScript later. So yeah, so these are using Node.js. So what you need to do, it gives you, so it basically assumes that you already have the, the Node environment installed. And what it, what it does next is just tell you how to go about getting started with a uh, uh, testing environment. In this case, it's with Jest. Jest is all the testing frameworks available in, in JavaScript. Um, there are also other testing frameworks out there like Mocha, uh, Jasmine, and a few others. But today, will be uh, this guide is only Jest. Uh, I accept pull requests. So if you want to write a, uh, write a guide for Jasmine or Mocha, please feel free to do so. So anyway, uh, so they tell you like open a new folder called new kata. Uh, and if you use yarn on npm, just type N npm uh, in it. Uh, then you install the necessary libraries here. In this, in this particular guide, we also include ES6, uh, uh, ES6 uh, module compilation. So we can, can use ES6 uh, syntax in Node.js, which is nice. So you use Babel to kind of uh, accomplish that. And you just uh, make sure that you include the test scripts. So I've included the, uh, the uh, so you just type npm test and you just you basically run the just test. You want to watch for changes in your file. You can use the npm run test colon watch and you basically do the do this thing. Um, of course, if, because you're using Babel, you must also include the Babel the Babel RC, which will basically turn turn on the uh, the pre uh, transcoding transpiling stuff. Uh, and yeah, there's also then you basically create two files. So in your case, it'll probably be a minesweeper.js and minesweeper test.js, right? So these are the two things. And of course, if you run the test, just type npm test or yarn test. Yeah, so it's up to you to whether you're using yarn or npm, although, yeah. Okay, so this is, uh, and then of course, there's a short link to the, to the matches you can use. So in this case, uh, <coughs> I mean, expect is a matcher in, uh, in, uh, uh, or rather to be rather is a is a matcher in in jest. You can also include other types of matches as well, right? So you can use to look at the built-in matches that you found in uh in this. Okay. Uh so yeah, do check out this repo. If you're if you're also not sure about how to go about writing tests, I've actually done a presentation before about how much should we test. <laughs> so I'll just do a quick hopefully I can do a quick one on this. Yeah, so how much should we test? It's actually based off uh, a video uh, from Sandy Metz, which is uh, a pretty awesome Ruby, uh, Ruby uh, the person. So yeah, how much should we test? Uh, your goal, he tells you about the goal of your test, to be thorough, stable, blah. Um, in the two approaches to writing tests, there's an inside out and outside in. So this one tells you about that. Um, it talks about test pyramid and object under test, how we should, be sending messages, incoming messages, outgoing messages, and usually it's categorized into query and commands, right? So uh, I'll send you all the link later and you can have a look at it. This is quite comprehensive. So look at it. Okay, so uh, are we okay so far? Are we okay so far? Is there a link to the actual kata? Okay, there's, uh, you want an actual kata link? Because uh, I have, I actually re, I got recompiled it, but you can actually look at it. Uh, it should be on codekata.com, I think. You should probably find something here. No, not code kata. Coding dojo. Sorry. And the katas, you can probably find the. Uh, Minesweeper. 
Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so under coding dojo dot org uh, slash kata slash minesweeper. You want a full link uh, to the where I got the inspiration from, right? Okay. So although uh, the kata here, or rather or the kata here is a bit different, as it tells you to use zero instead of of dots, um, but it's pretty much same concept as that. Okay. Right. Uh, are we all scared yet? Are we all are we all okay? <laughs> okay. All right. Um, once again, let me just show you this one. And uh, developers, start your engines. <laughs> Find your pair. Have you got a pair yet? Have you got a pair? <laughs> OK. Yeah. OK. And then uh, you can have the handouts. Max, can you help me? Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, can you just help me pass it out? Oh, got more. Okay, great, awesome. Oh, your paper as well? Okay, cool. All right. I'll see you guys on the other side. <laughs> okay, we're done.